Hello, Mikhail. Mikhail Nikolaev is a managing partner of Livkadia Valley. And it took 15 years for Livkadia uh, from the very start to become the most interesting and trendy wine producer and agritourist estate in Russia. What was the idea when your family decided to create Livkadia? And what was the long-term plan and how much it is completed by now? Well, hello, everyone. Um, it is a pleasure to be part of the series. Uh, let me start with the first question then. Um, I think that 15 years ago, the, the main idea for us as a family um, and for my father personally was to create something in Russia that would actually be of, uh, of a quality, of, a, of an interest, of an originality that would make Russian wine able to compete on a global scale in the sense uh, he didn't want to make something that was very large in terms of volume. Uh, his main objective was to actually look at all of the experiences and all of the investments that have been done that that, that have been done in Russia over the past years, and uh, all of those things that were done in Soviet times and and before, and basically figure out um, how to make wine in Russia that would be able to compete would be interesting. That would be the same would be interesting to consumers in Europe and, and globally. Um, overall, starting with that small plan, uh, the, with a small winery and a, in a very high quality focused production, uh, obviously the Fkadia Valley grew. Uh, we quickly realized that in order to achieve this goal, we have to be, we don't have to be alone. We, we actually have to have others in the same area that would be willing to do the same thing and therefore we have to create our own competitors in some sense. And therefore, um, together, uh, we can actually come up with a regional product. So not, uh, Lefkadia is not just about uh, the, the winery that my father created, but it's also about a, a wine region. And um, right now, we, we're seeing the first part of this uh, regional plan uh completed we have we have already five different producers here so far not that not as many wineries but uh, at least we have people that are willing to to invest and and create a product a high quality product made here that uh, in some sense will be different from the wines that we make um therefore starting from a from i guess a very ambitious personal project Lefkadia has grown into a, an ambition, ambitious regional project. And uh, therefore, um, I think that if we uh, see it, um, if we can I guess, uh, draw a line um, and, and look at it from, from this perspective of the last 15 years, um, we have realized our objective, uh, our first objective, which was to create a, uh, a world-class winery and a, a world-class wine but uh, we still haven't realized our objective in, our second objective basically that is creating a, a region that would be recognizable and would be interesting to consumers globally i could say that uh, you invited for consulting for my consulting one of the most famous technologist patrick leon from Monton rothschild well the Obviously, we had to we had to work with with those that have uh, actually realized similar projects globally. The Rothschild family invested in Napa Valley and invested in Chile, uh, together with local partners in creating projects such, such as Opus One and Alma Viva. And the head winemaker for those projects was our head winemaker for about ten years, Patrick Leon, from two thousand and eight until two thousand eighteen. So he sadly passed away, and. Um, when when we realized that we want to make a globally interesting wine, we had to learn how, you know, there's a saying, you have to learn to, to walk before you learn how to run. And we kind of, um, we bought that experience, we bought that knowledge, and we brought in uh, him and, and others, uh, such as Rodolphe Peters and, and Gilles Rey as consultants on board to, um, well, to realize uh, the potential of the land, but also to, to train a new generation of local uh, winemakers, uh, of local farmers that would see uh, winemaking in a different light 
and would strive with us uh, to create something uh, of a different quality than what was being done before. Can you tell that your wines are in premium wine market, luxury wine market, or how do you feel about uh, your products and the market itself? Well, I, I don't think we have yet uh, made a wine that, that I would call luxurious. So we're not in the luxury segment um, because, well, uh, I think it takes a lot of time. And I think it takes, uh, obviously, a global presence uh, to be luxurious in the sense that I would see it. Uh, we are definitely in the premium segment in Russia. And uh, globally, I think that uh, some of our wines can be considered part of the premium segment, both in terms of pricing, but also in terms of the quality, in terms of the style, because different, uh, I guess, price points, uh, different consumers expect different things from, from their wines. Uh, to me, a premium wine uh, and basically a high quality wine is a wine that can age for a long time, that can show its potential over many years. And that's why it carries a higher price uh because obviously time makes it better and it makes it more rare as well uh, a luxurious product a product that is uh, that is part of a of an industry uh, that has grown a lot over the past years is something that i think we haven't been able to create yet but we we definitely will be trying to do that over the next years and um hopefully we'll succeed great now back to the history and Lefkadia has a concept of reconstruction of the ancient uh, Greek city-state uh, with its own agora, theater, archon house, and ancient winery. All that is in honor of the Bosporan Kingdom that was uh, actually the first state here in the south of Russia uh, from the 5th century before Christ. And why is the history of the territory important for identity of the brand, of your brand, and development of tourism on your territory? Well, obviously, uh, wine is a product that is made by time, and uh, you, you requires a lot of time to figure out uh, how wine should be made in a, in a certain part of the world. Um, and it is important to look at the history of, of that part. If you want to make a wine that is recognizable and that is in some sense unique and therefore that is valuable to the consumer um history for us is especially important because russia for many consumers in russia and globally as well is not uh, associated with a winemaking country even though uh, these lands have been making wine for two and a half thousand years and uh, this history i think is very important both on the local market and the global market in order to to let people understand how um, we're not coming out of nowhere and therefore we can actually offer a product with um, a certain identity uh, with a certain uniqueness and therefore with with a certain value the bosporan kingdom is something that we have uh, tried to be associated with because it is a period of time that uh, that saw a lot of vineyards uh, created here i mean we know now that uh, these colonies these greek and roman colonies used to export uh, wine to the mediterranean countries therefore it definitely was a, a place of surplus and therefore it was a wealthy place a place of, of a consumption of interesting and high quality products and that means that it's a history that we we have to not only be proud of but we have to really look into uh, if you want to uh, make uh, not only a brand, but if we actually want to make a wine that would be uh, that would differentiate us from the rest, we we look a lot in, uh, into uh, amphora winemaking. That's the general term described uh, for for wines that are fermented and and or aged in ancient clay amphoras. I know that it's a very trendy thing right now, but uh, for us, it's not only about the trend; it's also about the history. We have in our wine museum some of these old uh, winemaking amphora, and we have been working with uh, modern reconstructions or modern replicas of these amphoras in making wine. And therefore, it's sort of rethinking and, and re reapplying the, that history, those traditions uh, for, for the vineyards that are, for the wines that are made here, for the, for the grapes that are grown here. Your wine museum, which you mentioned, is great. And I think it is one of the best wine museums in Europe. And uh, 
We're working hard. On, I think the collection uh, has gone a lot better over the past few years. Thanks a lot. Thanks in part to the to the ancient uh, archaeological discoveries that, that we've seen over the past few years. But um, uh, again, we always wanted to make a wine museum that is about Russian wine, not only about us or about Nefkadia Valley in Crete, uh, simply because we, we felt that there's a lack of, of uh, understanding and a lack of uh, of knowledge about the fact that Russia is definitely one of the old world uh, winemaking regions. And it's something that I think we can be proud of. Uh, we all are proud of uh, this uh, estate and uh, particularly wine museum. And I could say uh, very big PFAS and uh, many amphoras, original amphoras from the ancient times represented there. And uh, as you tell, uh, amphora is a symbol for not only winemaking, but also you uh, use amphora name for your restaurant. And wine yeah. is part of cultural heritage, terroir, and gastronomic traditions of the territory, of your territory. And um, how these elements are integrated in the strategy of development and communications of Lefkadia? I mean, all that uh, heritage, terroir, gastronomy, all that elements are very important for wine uh, promotion as well. Well, um, yeah, one important simple thing for, for uh for our understanding of the way we develop this region is that a place that is good for vineyards is generally good for people as well in terms of the quality of life it provides and is good for a, a, an array of products that we have over time started to associate with the, the Mediterranean diet that we believe is very healthy. Uh, something similar is the, the Black Sea diet, I guess, pretty similar to the Mediterranean diet in that sense. and. Um, we wanted from the beginning to to have not only vineyards here but also farms i mean not all the land is suitable for vineyards you have forests that you have to preserve you have to create a, a balanced ecosystem that uh, you know that is not only uh, like an industry it's not only devoted to the production of one single product and in creating that balanced ecosystem you can say a, a farming system where you have both uh, honey and, and plants and, and sheep and, and cows and things like that. Um, we have started creating many products that we use in our gastronomy, we use in, in, uh, in, in promoting our wines. And uh, it's something that I think is of great interest for people that not only are tourists and they come and they, they try our things here, but also for people that, that will be living here uh, and that are living here now and hopefully there'll be more that'll be living here in the future. Um, because to me, uh, quality of life is uh, not only related to the climate, but is also very much related to the products that you consume, to your diet, um, to your you know, the, the balance that you have in your body. Um, and therefore, you have to have very uh, good, high quality, clean products. So in developing a territory, you have to think about points of attraction. And winemaking is definitely one of them. The museum and the beautiful views are some of them as well. But we we've added all of these possible points of attraction such as good food um water which is actually this is an area of, of very interesting mineral waters that is still very much to be discovered uh both in the local both in the local market and in the global market and uh um, hospitality in the sense uh i think this this is a, an area of a, of a singular uh singularly good ecology uh, for, for russian standards and therefore is a good area for uh um, like i say medical clusters and and just simple holistic uh spas and things like that all your uh, territory is very individual and do you think individuality is important for a uh, premium segment in wines or uh what characteristics should have uh premium wine or everyday products i think that consumers want to communicate they want to know what they're what they're drinking at the end of the day and they want to know the people that are behind it and they want to know the land that is behind it because that's what makes it uh that's what gives it value uh we see a lot of consolidation in the market in general globally i mean a lot of brands are merging or they're buying out each other uh, especially in the traditional markets and that definitely has had an effect in terms of the variety of, of wines and variety of, of products that people have uh, and that are accessible to them day to day. 
there is a, a a trend against that sort of a, a protest trend where people they they, they want to stay small and they want to stay uh, local and uh, we really much favor this trend because we believe that uh, only um, a small or relatively small producer that is working in a very concrete area can deliver a product that is differentiable from the others and therefore can have um, the sort of value the sort of uniqueness uh, that that would make it interesting for a particular group of consumers i think that in the right now we're seeing that the future of premium let's put it that way and the future of luxury um, is not about a universal uh, product so that's not the way it used to be where everybody used to think uh, that a certain brand uh, was the uh, ultimate form of luxury i think right now people are looking for much more individuality mainly because the world has become much more globalized it's much it's much easier to buy things that before it was much harder you know before you used to have to travel to paris to buy a particular brand now you can just buy it online out of anywhere and because of that, people are looking for things that are, will differentiate them. Any things. It can be T-shirts, but it also it also applies to wine. And um, people want to have a product that makes them feel unique and uh, that is closer to them uh, in, a, in a very big and very globalized, very sort of empty world where it's hard to find your own individuality. Wine is a very much individual product. And I like very much that Lefkadia keeps individuality in uh, all wines, uh, either everyday wines or more uh, premium wines. All range are quite recognizable. And I think I'm against making a product that is basically the Coca-Cola of wine. And mm -hmm. we have the very, very clear example, for example, in the United States, in, in California in particular. Uh, and to us, that has it's been one of the main examples in terms of the development of winemaking here. And there was a, a period where uh, production was not uh, related to a particular plot. So there were no terroir driven wines, they say. Yeah. Basically, like making Coca Cola. And it used to be the same in Soviet times. There were no brands associated with a particular vineyard. Mm -hmm. And um, that definitely is something that in the future um, will mean uh, that there's no individual individuality in the wine. And we'll be looking at wines if, if that sort of model. It was triumphant. We'll be looking at wines as just any other uh, industrial product. And I think that wines are not and they should not be an industrial product. They should be a very uh, human, a very particular product. That, and they should basically uh, convey the four elements of terroir. So it's the climate, the, the soils, uh, the particular varieties that are suited to, to this land, and also the people uh, that make them. Uh, to me, for example, if the winemaker changes and the style of the wine changes, that is something that is very positive. It means that there was a lot of uh, personal and human input, uh, and therefore there was a lot of value in that product. And to keep the terroir healthy, of course, it's very important to implement the principles of sustainable development. And I think you are very much looking about that in Livkadia. How these uh, principles are used or why they are so important for your territory? Well, from the beginning, uh, because we work with Gilles Ray, who's our consultant agronomist, and because we understand that winemaking is an agricultural um, industry, and that uh, means that uh, you first have to focus on the land if you want to have a good wine, um, and you have to take care of the land because you have to look at wine as a product that uh, it takes a lot of time to, to really come into its own. Therefore, uh, from the beginning, we were looking at the vineyards as something that we have to work sustainably uh, we weren't organic right at the beginning simply because it was very complicated for for territories that were used for conventional farming in the past to switch to organic production immediately uh, but we have started slowly switching our vineyards to, to organic and fully organic farming um, that's just one of the elements of sustainability but also sustainability is not only is not only about farming there's also other elements uh it's about having a as i said a balance between forests vineyards meadows you know you you don't you cannot have in my opinion a sustainable region if it's dedicated to the production of just one single product 
Um, sustainability is also about things like the weight of the bottle, which we didn't think before. And uh, I think that's something that people talk a lot about more now, that heavy bottles are probably unnecessary for, for still wines. They're still necessary for sparkling wines because of the pressure inside the bottle. But for many still wines, heavy bottles are just a sort of posh uh, element that has nothing to do, and it's actually detrimental for the environment, um, in, especially in terms of the emissions, in terms of the energy it takes to, to, to transport a heavy bottle. Things like that, you know, using corks that are not made out of natural wood, things that historically were not well seen in premium and luxury products before, you know, premium luxury has to be natural corks. But now people are starting, starting to realize that actually uh, the natural cork industry is affecting very negatively uh, the forests in Europe that produce this cork. And we should be switching to alternative uh, forms uh, of, of closing our bottles. It could be glass, it could be steel, it can be, I don't know, there's, there's even uh, processed corks. And I think that uh, sustainability is, is looking at the whole picture uh, and understanding that in the long run, because wine is a product that that takes a lot of time and and because wine investments they definitely take a lot of time to to pay back, uh, it, you you do think in this industry a lot more about the effect that you will have over time uh, on the land and on on the environment around you. More and more luxury brands became responsible for consumption, for production. Modern winemaking in Russia started, I would say, in the beginning of 2000s. Yeah, more, more or less this time. I guess so, yeah. yeah. The, the, most of the producers that, that were then uh, um, growing, many of them have already gone bankrupt. But now, now there's a whole new wave of, of producers that are coming into the market. So, and uh, year by year, we see that Russian wines show absolutely positive dynamic and quality in the international market among uh, very uh, respected world wine experts. And I know your wines sent uh, to different uh, ratings, like Robert Parker rating, and uh, you have very good scores. We are on the way to the great Russian wines, I would say, <laughs> every year. Hopefully, yeah. What are the elements of a great wine? Uh, do you think uh, when we can produce a great wine in Russia, you can produce? Well, um, I think that uh, to be great, you have to be, first of all, unique, so recognizable. Um, it has to be a product that is tied either to the history or to the realities. Maybe the, there's new realities in the land, for example. There's, the climate has changed so much over the few hundred years that, that you have to make a great wine of, out of something else. But uh, it definitely has to be a recognizable product. Uh, I think that it has to be a, a wine that can age for a long time. I think that's, as I said before, the main difference between a good wine and a great wine is time. Um, because you, you, it, technically it's not hard to make a wine that is tasty and that is actually interesting and maybe even unique. But it is very hard um, to have all of these elements improve over time, especially over a long time. And uh, recently, I, I heard an opinion from, from a wine merchant, which I agree with very much. And he said that the first uh, moment, the moment that we can say that Russia has made a great wine is when uh, the first Russian wine um, that is older than 50 years uh, is still very interesting and it's still uh, very much alive. We know that in Soviet times there were wines like that made. There's a, a state collection uh, actually housed in a, in a village right on the eastern part of Lefkadia Valley. And in that state collection you have wines from the 1950s that are still very much alive and still interesting. But um, I wouldn't say that they have evolved in a very positive way. So they're drinkable, but they're not exceptional. While in the great uh, terroirs of the world, in Bordeaux or Burgundy or, I don't know, in, in, in Chianti, you'd have wines that are over 100 years old that are still uh, very much uh, at the peak of their potential. So I think that uh, time will tell. Um, and I think that time will make some of the wines that we have already made better. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, some of the wines that we have made over the past years will survive over 50 years. And uh, at that point, we can sit down and say, okay, well, this 
is the wine that we made in 2012 and um it maybe is the first great wine that was made uh in post-soviet russia do you have an archive of your first vintages we do we do um yeah these things you know young vines are definitely more complicated uh, in terms of uh, making wines that have a longer aging potential. So the first vintages that we have, they're still alive, of course. Our first vintage was, was 2009 from two-year-old vines, which technically, uh, it's not usually the, these grapes are not even used to, to make wine, but we, we were, you know, we wanted to make wine really fast. So um, th these wines are still very interesting, but I wouldn't say that uh, the first one or two vintages are of of the same level uh that the wines that are being made now and definitely it's, it's a matter of age it's also a matter of experience uh it's also a matter of luck maybe you know some of the vintages that we have uh from from the earlier years that are very good they'll be able to to show their potential in many many years to come uh what do you think the potential of local grape varietals for the luxury market or shall we follow European grapes or shall we cultivate local grapes? The problem with uh, the idea of local grapes is uh, when we look at the history of the land and we talked about the Bosporan kingdom, uh, there were grapes uh, being used then that are not in use now. Then there was another culture that came that used different varieties. And then there was another culture because, you know, uh, objectives change and the idea of a local grape that has been in the land forever is a bit of a it's a fallacy it's a bit of a lie uh, most of the grapes that are used now they're called locally are grapes that appeared over the last 200 years um, so it's not that like their history in most cases has thousands of years uh, i think that a grape is local when it, it can be brought from outside but it adapts to the local conditions so we can see, for example, with Cabernet Franc, which is definitely not a grape that comes from the Caucasus area, but um, Cabernet Franc has adapted here in Lefkadia Valley better than many varieties that would be considered more traditional, such as Sapiravi. Mm -hmm. uh, and from a uh, vine grower's point of view, it means that Cabernet Franc is more local because it responds better to local climate and soil conditions. And therefore, um, theoretically speaking, uh, in maybe 50 or 100 years, we'll be seeing that a certain clone or a certain adaptation of Cabernet Franc will be considered, in my opinion, the local variety for our land. Um, again, if we look at traditional varieties, so uh, without using the word local, varieties such as Sapiravi from the Caucasus, or varieties such as Krasnostop from the Don region, uh, these varieties, um, they're very irregular and I think there hasn't been enough work done in terms of the selection process and in terms of uh, the techniques that are used to cultivate them for us to make wines that are um, as interesting and as age worthy as wines made from varieties that we call international. In the sense, you can have a very tasty crust and stop, but I haven't had a crust and stop that is over 10 years old uh that is as interesting as a merlot for example that is over 10 years old grown in the same area okay. and uh, because uh, i think that aging potential is the main way uh, in determining the quality of the wine uh that's why i think that many of these traditional varieties such as krasnostop or separavi it will be very hard for them to to get into the luxury market uh right now yeah, I think we are on the way to understand and to realize potential of local grapes and to give them a kind of new life. The problem is it might be as well a bit of a lie, you know. Um, we can try to move that way instead of looking into something new. For example, there might be our own local selections of different uh, international varieties mm -hmm. that will provide a wine that will be more interesting to consumers. Because at the, at the end of the day, uh, I think that it is the the market that should decide what is more valuable, uh, not just uh, us. So we have our own opinion, but it's, it has to be the opinion of everyone in that sense. Yeah, interesting. And I hope in the future, or probably, you uh, will bring 
uh, another grapes which were local for this area two and a half thousand years ago from Greece. Who knows? Maybe. Well, yes, but the the, the Greek varieties that are in Greece now they were they didn't exist probably back then. So it's yeah, uh, it's a bit of a, Asia, maybe. It's very hard to really know what is the sort of wine. And we we looked at it and we it's very important to us um but it's very hard to know exactly what they used to drink um hopefully <laughs> the ones we're making now uh will probably be at least as good as the ones that were being made before thank you thank you mikhail it's a great pleasure to hear a story of Livkadia valley from you and i would like to invite uh from your permission all our guests uh, to visit Livkadia very much we'll be very happy to meet you here and uh, we have a small but uh, but quite interesting uh, tourism uh, i guess a tourist destination there there's tastings there's restaurants and there's a small guest house and definitely there'll be there'll be more openings over the next few years and i hope everybody can make it out here and see a completely different russia from what many people i think imagined 